Where does black gold come from? And no, I don't mean this hot bean water. <laughs> I mean oil and fossil fuels. Where do fossil fuels come from? What are the fossils of which fossil fuel is made? I think a lot of us just intuitively think it's made out of something like dinosaurs, old animals, but that is not the case. For the majority of the time life has been on Earth for billions of years, that life has been small, single-celled organisms or plants. And because fossil fuels take a lot of time and pressure and heat to form into the uh, hydrocarbons that we consider fossil fuels, humans, dinosaurs, animals just haven't been around long enough to turn into fossil fuel. In fact, nearly all of fossil fuel comes from either bacteria in the early oceans or plants in the Carboniferous period, millions of years before there were even dinosaurs. So, <laughs> I guess we can all forget about T-Rex on mobile. <laughs> this is also crude. and welcome to Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections, and I drill down into them until I find a wellspring of nerdy goodness. <laughs> We're buying a house. And then I tell you what's coming up, because <laughs> if you got rich, because you got rich, you'd, you'd buy a house. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint. <laughs> but getting right down to it, in the last episode of Because Science, we were trying to figure out how to steal the only car that's in space floating around space, we'll get to that. More specifically, we are trying to figure out how exactly a supervillain, if they wanted to, which I do not condone, could steal Elon Musk's midnight cherry Tesla Roadster with Starman floating about in our solar system. I gave you an outline and I said exactly how long it would take and what trajectory it would take and all that good stuff. And you can watch the episode if you wanna know more. But what I wanna know right now is what you have to say. Our first comment comes from Zachary Nigbor, who says, Hey Kyle, the price of the space car would skyrocket <laughs> nice. If someone ever brought it back since it was in space. Now, in the episode, I said that if you were a supervillain and you launched a mission to return the Tesla to Earth, even at supervillain auction, it probably wouldn't get enough money to refund even a portion of your mission costs. And that's because how much would someone pay for a space car, you think? Couple mil? Less than 10? My, my point being, a space mission can cost hundreds of millions of dollars, especially one that you need to keep <coughs> off the books. So unless a space car could feasibly go for hundreds of millions of dollars, I, I don't think it would be really worth it, monetarily speaking. But for the supervillain principle of the thing, definitely, I could see a supervillain Bond-style person driving around and like, well, that's because it's the only car that's ever been to space! And the supervillain's name would be... Cold finger. Space is cold. Aaron Pepelis says, the only sports car in space, Kyle. That seems very specifically stated for something uh, you're trying to cover. Uh, no, I was just being specific because there are technically cars on the moon. There are still moon rovers on the moon and I didn't want any of you pedants to say that there are, Kyle, there's already cars uh, outside of Earth's atmosphere. There's some on the moon. And no, I know. That's why I said it's the only sports car currently floating in space. It's weird how specific I have to get with that. Our next comment is from YouTube creator who says, hey, Kyle, there's a problem. If anyone actually did this, the Tesla would be beat up all to heck and back from micro rocks and the extreme cold, etc. Yes, that's something that I did not talk about. If you were to bring a space car back down to Earth, we don't even know if it would run. What we know would happen is that it would go through extreme cycles of heating and cooling, like 200 degrees and then negative 200 degrees, and this would cause a differential heating of the chassis of the car and the metals would expand and shrink and probably put weird stresses on the body, and anything that wasn't metallic, like paint and plastic, might be eroded or eaten or even boiled away. Solar wind could mess up all the electronics in a complicated car like a Tesla, so who knows if it would even run if you got it back to Earth. But that would probably be the coolest restoration project you can think of, right? I gotta make this car Earth-worthy again. Oh, that just sounds cool. And it's something that your stepdad can do on the weekends instead of playing with you. 
I almost lost it there for a second. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I gotta give to now frequent commenter Carrie Noir, who has a lot of Kyle slash Void canon that may or may not be correct. What I like the most about Carrie's comment is this. Since the last footnotes, you said more Kyle's the better. I do feel like your master plan then will have something to do with making enough clones of yourself to make an army. Train them physically with rock climbing and then mentally with Magic the Gathering in the Void. Unleash them onto the world. Destroy all the superheroes that stand in your way and recruit all the super nerds you keep tabs on with your list, which I do in fact keep. Take over the world. Force everyone into a routine of taking care of themselves and being nice to each other. Shut down most energy plants and re Replace them with alternative energy and like nuclear stuff and generally invest more money into healthcare science and argan oil. I mean, I'm, I'm with you so far. What I'm currently missing is what Dr. Moo and Nate's part in this plan are and the function of the red string necklace slash amulet of dark power you wear around your neck. Hopefully these will be revealed eventually. For the record, I'm not gonna stop you, but I'm curious to see what happens next. <laughs> Me too. I'm gonna be honest. I don't even know. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's this guy named Gary. Yeah, he's getting real close. Yeah, clone 526. With a candlestick? In the library? <laughs> no one will pick up on those clues. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was just awarding you, Carrie, with a super nerd. <laughs> Be prepared in the library. <laughs> but of course, I'm not always right. I was very willing to give Death Stranding a chance, but it turned out to just be a walking simulator. <laughs> so what did I get wrong last week? First correction comes from Zach C, who says, just gonna point out, throwing in words like definitely not, hypothetically, etc., does not protect you from legal liabilities regarding your supervillain plan. The video shows significant knowledge of the plan, if executed, and while it is hearsay, it definitely falls under one of the exceptions to be admitted as evidence in court. Just a reminder, every good supervillain supervillain has a great lawyer. Yeah, I guess it's technically true that even though I don't support or condone the actions of stealing a space car, it's still illegal. Or is it? Because Matthew Barron has a correction who says, arguably, it is not stealing the space car. It is abandoned property. It would be a salvage operation. So yeah, I guess if Elon Musk did put Starman in an orbit and it would stay in that orbit with the attached rocket for millions of years with no plans to take it back, you know, longer than his lifespan, unless he becomes like an artificial intelligence or something, then it would be considered abandoned property and then you could just go into space and salvage it like a Tesla pirate. So is it stealing? I don't know, only one way to find out. <laughs> Rich England has a very pedantic correction. He says, wouldn't what's not being built underground on Mars, there's definitely nothing that I'm building on Mars. Wouldn't it be not called a uh, subterranean, but it would be called sub-Martian? Yes? Subterranean, subterra, meaning underneath the surface of Earth. Now, while you could consider Earth to mean just under the dirt of a planet, it would be more fun and more technical, the best kind of fun, <laughs> to say submartian or subvenusian or subneptunian or something like that, and or a sub a subjovian submarine. Or uh, no, but it's under gas. But a subjovian subgas ship plane. Yes. Aaron McCullough has a correction and they say that when I said when we are making our transfer orbit to something like the Roadster or Mars, you would need two burns for a typical home and transfer. And if you're doing that, you transfer burn into the elliptical orbit and you transfer burn into the orbit that you want. But that's not always the case. We are assuming a perfect ideal situation where everything was on the same plane. But in real life, in the universe, in our galaxy, in our solar system, not everything is always perfectly on the same plane. Things are tilted, and so, as Aaron points out, there would be mid-course burns to correct planar inclinations, and that's pretty much needed in every transfer in the real world. So yes, Aaron, we are assuming an absolutely ideal case, but we didn't have enough time for all of the pop quizzes needed to do all of the necessary corrections, but a good one. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to super nerd already science with Steph, who says, home and transfer orbits can be counterintuitive 
to begin with, you wouldn't necessarily need the space transfer website to calculate the time of transfer. You can calculate the time or a very good estimate of that time using Kepler's third law of planetary motion. That is the square of the orbital period is directly proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of the orbit. And then she goes through some math, giving a total orbit time of 457 Earth days, which comes out to around 15 months. And in the episode, we said around 16 months. So Steph, your numbers are right in the ballpark, just doing back of the envelope calculations. You say nice episode, Kyle. I say nice calculations, Steph. Thanks for getting so deep into the episode. You are indeed now part of an exclusive club, a three time super nerd. Ah! Am I dying? Now, moving right along to this week's episode of Because Science. You may know what a lightsaber is, but what is the dark saber? That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, just in time for The Mandalorian dropping on Disney+, Plus, we are taking a slightly obscure but very awesome Star Wars weapon, the Dark Saber, and we're trying to figure out how it works. How can it function if it's supposed to be like a lightsaber, but it doesn't look like it emits any light of its own? How can it cut? What is it made of? How do it be do? <laughs> we try to figure out that we must. <laughs> But before we figure out what a Darksaber is, please go watch the last episode of Because Science if you haven't yet, all about how to steal Elon Musk's personal car from space. And leave me all of your nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. I'm just making space. And don't forget, uh, really important this week, if you take anything away from this episode and away from this channel, just under all circumstances, please, just re Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I can talk. No, nah, I was just gonna tell him about, like, starfish poop. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, love you, bye.